So for me as a leader, one of the takeaways is that number one, I need to know what gives me joy and what gives me energy. And so, you know, one of the answers, I'm definitely like, I hope people aren't hearing me and saying that teachers don't work hard because I think that teachers, you know, in schools, education sector, people do work really hard and I think they are working harder than ever. But maybe part of the solution is actually for me to know the types of things that uh, I can get energy from and so I can lean into that and then hopefully by the end of the week maybe there'll be some more, some better outcomes for my energy levels and, and, and the school will actually get more out of me in, if I lean into those spaces. The Better Mindset Podcast. Welcome to the Better Mindset Podcast, Episode 8. I'm Mark. And I'm Bex. Conversations about leadership, learning, and educational technologies. On today's episode, we've got an inspiring conversation with a teacher about his five-year-long STEAM project with his class and counting. We hear about some new features on Canva, the tool that keeps on giving, and we dip our toes into a new approach to tackling the teacher burnout crisis that faces our schools everywhere. All right, Bex, for Making Waves today, it's my turn to bring up the topic, and I've been thinking about probably what I think is one of the most... Let, let me ask you the question. What would you say would be the biggest concern or stressor or thing that is concerning leadership in schools uh, pretty much worldwide at the moment? I would say the rapid shift in the way we teach and learn and the all the changes in technology, just a massive disruption to how we teach in education right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and the thing that that's leading to that wasn't quite ex- the ex- the answer that I was hoping for. Sorry. The thing that it, no, 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 it all leads through. The thing that it's leading to is is overwhelm and almost burnout. Mm. You know, like I know that mm. in some of the Australian states, uh, there are you know um, incredibly high numbers of teachers are either resigning or uh, leaving the profession or are thinking about it like I think it's you know double the normal rate I know that in in the states the same across the states there and in New Zealand here we've got a lot of principals particularly in the New Zealand sector are leaving the profession and Mm. the the topic I wanted to talk about I'll give you the give you the title of what I've put down Uh, the title is called stop playing with the dead birds already so <laughs> that's interesting, isn't it? Stop playing with the dead birds. And I'll, and I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. It actually came from a conversation that I had with a staff when I was running a teacher-only day um, in New Zealand at the start of this year. And, and I made the statement that I think that a lot of the overwhelm that a lot of us are feeling in education and the burnt out um, nature that we're in, even though it was at the very start of the year, I said that one of the reasons I think that we're feeling so burnt out is not that we've got too much work, but that a lot of us are doing the wrong kinds of work. So what So what, I'm, what do I mean by the dead bird analogy? Please, if you're from the SPCA or um, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you're a bird lover, please, I'm, not, I'm talking metaphorically about birds. So I'll, I'll just wind <laughs> it back a little bit. Uh, at the start of this year, I had the chance to sit the certification for the working genius. Um, model and framework and for those of you who have listened to the podcast all the way for since uh, episode one it's come up a couple of times because the working genius model from Patrick Lencioni says that there are six letters to every job and six geniuses effectively so everything that we have to do in schools uh, whether we're planning and assessing or whether we're trying to uh, you know do a curriculum refresh or we're running you know just anything in, in our classroom spaces or as a leader in our school Everything has six letters, uh, six geniuses that you have to go through. So it all starts with a question that you ask. So that's the genius of wonder. And then the, the next role or the letter, letter I is that having an idea. So you have a, um, a wonder, then you have an idea, and then it moves through to the discernment phase. So somebody has to be able to ask some questions about whether that's going to work or not and make some statements then you need to galvanize and then we're talking about the genius of enablement and tenacity and so we'll put a link um, in the show notes if you'd like to look into those geniuses a little bit later but the the framework says that every job is a six letter word um, and so there are six geniuses that you have to go through and for every single person there are two of those part two two aspects of that job that give us joy and give us um, life and and we get lots of energy from them but then two that um, that we are not so good at we might be good at it but we we can't do it for very long it doesn't give us joy they're they're called our working competence or our frustration sorry so those are the the things that don't um, give us joy so two that are your strengths you give you joy and two that aren't 
And for a lot of us in the roles that we're playing in schools, sometimes I know for me, I, I can be working the same amount of hours in a week and one week I can feel ex absolutely exhausted and then the next week feeling energized and I just want to keep going and I don't want to stop. You know, it's, it, it all becomes you know, something that I, I, I come alive at. The podcast is one thing. Like I love you know, jumping on these calls and, and uh, interviewing because a lot of the, the things that we're doing on these podcasts, mm. we're, we're asking questions and we're talking about ideas and we're coming up with lots of different things. Um, that that give us that give me joy because my geniuses are wonder and invention. Um, I'm a WI um, in the framework, but for a lot of teachers, a lot of us and leaders in schools, we're doing things in our schools that are robbing us of that energy and robbing us of that joy. So if I said to you, you know, what are your what would be your two frustrations in the working genius specs? For me is discernment and tenacity. So I hate having to think about all the bad things or how things could go wrong in an idea. Uh, and then I'm also really not that good at finishing things off. Uh, so those are my two frustrations. Yeah, and so in any particular week, imagine if you had a week where you were chasing a whole lot of people to sort through some of the problems that they were having with things and then you were having to chase up contracts and make sure that spreadsheets were completed and all that kind of thing. At the end of that week, because those were the, the those are the frustrations, if your job was heavily leaning into those, then you would be exhausted. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think for a lot of us, and I think of myself, I'm, I'm almost the same, my frustrations are E and T. So if I had to support and help people do a whole lot of things like I'm, I love to support people but I just don't like to mm. you know be given a tick sheet of things I need to work through and so you know when I was a teacher in that situation I'd get exhausted at the end of the day if it was about me following someone else's lesson plan or if someone said hey here's the unit that I want you to do go away and run this unit with your classroom that would just tire me out and I think that for mm. a lot of people it can be the reverse so if your frustrations are you know, in the planning phase or coming up with ideas for lesson plans or if, or if you're, and those aren't your geniuses, then you're going to be really tired about that. Um, so the the big idea behind the working genius is that you want, it doesn't mean that you don't do those frustrations, but it, because sometimes you just have to, that's just the nature of work. But it's about trying to get a bit of an 80-20 or trying to lean into the things that we know give us energy and, and bring us alive. So for me, I'm always looking for opportunities to be creative um, and explore those different parts of my classroom practice or the things in my school that I'm leading. Uh, what are the areas that I can look at that we can start to ask some questions about and you know, how can we get some teachers together to solve some problems um, or some parents and some students and things. So, so the big idea is... To have more energy, it's not about doing less hours. Um, it's not about you know removing some of the things from my plate. It's about me maybe taking some of those things off my plate that don't give me energy and giving them to somebody else, recognizing that not only will that give me more joy, but it might actually give them more joy because they might enjoy those things. Mm -hmm. They really enjoy running that lesson plan and following mm. up that spreadsheet and checking students' assessment records and all of those types of things. Those are the things that they really love. But the types of things that give me energy might not be their energy givers. Um, so what does this have to do with the dead bird analogy? Well, it all comes out of, um, in the certification, one of the things that they taught us was that often what I do, because my geniuses are W and I, what I will often try and do is or intuitively I'll just think hey let's order let's let's I really enjoy being creative with my planning and my assessment so I'm going to pull some other teachers into that because they'll really enjoy that as well and that's like your cat bringing you a dead bird into the house <laughs> because the cat enjoys the dead bird and so thinks that you want it as well and you know if you've mm -hmm. ever had a cat and you've been in that situation it's terrible because there's feathers everywhere and, and goodness <laughs> knows what else um, or if the bird's alive it's flying around and flapping around now the, the cat is really chuffed because the cat thinks that it's mm -hmm. bringing you something that you're going to enjoy and is going to give you life but for those of us who don't don't live in cat world or don't you know <laughs> think that we're cats that's that's a disaster so for me as a leader one of the takeaways is that I Number one, I need to know what gives me joy and what gives me energy. And so, you know, one of the answers, I'm definitely like, I hope people aren't hearing me and saying that teachers don't work hard because I think that teachers, you know, in schools, education sector, people do work really hard and I think they are working harder than ever. But maybe part of the solution is actually for me to know the types of things that 
uh, I can get energy from, and so I can lean into that. And then hopefully by the end of the week, maybe there'll be some more, some better outcomes for my energy levels, and 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 the school will actually get more out of me in, if I lean into those spaces. But also mm. as a leader, uh, also as a teacher in the classroom, when I'm thinking of the types of things that I know you, for example, get energy from, I'm not going to give you some jobs that I know will drain your, your tank. So I'll look for the people, if I've got something on my plate that I think somebody else would want, I'm not going to take them a dead bird. Um, I'm going to take try and give it to somebody who sees that as something that's really uh, life-giving and is going to give them energy. So it's twofold. Mm -hmm. It's knowing about my own genius and what gives me energy and looking for those things but then also knowing what my team need and the types of things that they're going to get life and energy from um, and mm. then enabling them to be able to lean into that. So it's a real kind of a, it's a seesaw balance, isn't it, between knowing yourself and knowing others. I'm thinking of staff room and uh, meetings and I'm thinking of events that you have to do for the school. So for example, say a cultural festival or some sort of parent evening or something like that. And in that staff, you should know where they sit in terms yep. of what gives them energy. So there might be some real clever clogs that are like Rachel who talk about um, the Canva and they could be the ones that design and create all the advertisements for it. But there might be someone that wants to create the Google form of who's who's going to be developing um, the, the attendance, who's coming along, that kind of thing. So I guess it's kind of like there's mm. a big task to be done. Instead of dumping it on one person's desk, thinking about how that could be evenly distributed across the staff so that everyone is working in a, in a space that they find that is a genius, so that they find they get their energy from, rather than giving it all to one person where from woe to go is absolutely going to drain them. I mean, it's even any, any staff meeting, um, there may be a, a way that you could restructure the staff meeting so that people only attend where they sit, where they best fit into that uh, corridor or the conversation that's going on. Um, because I do see on teacher Facebook's pages the amount of meetings and things like that that they have to attend, and that's one of the things that will drain lots of people. However, there's some people that would absolutely love being at meetings because they want to be completely over all the details they want to know everything that's going on mm. so that would make them feel better if they knew everything so it's 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 disruption it's disrupting the the what we go what how we do things yeah. now at, at a right at the moment now the workloads in education is just growing rapidly like the expectations on teachers the expectations on slt so this is something that's going to continue to happen so how are we going to combat that um, so that we don't all end up feeling like we're just giving out dregs by week four. Like, this is what I'm seeing. Like, by week four, people are absolutely stuffed. And so, yeah, so it's looking at ways like this framework that we can put people in the right places so that they're going to get energized from tasks that have to be done. You can't yeah. say no to them. Yeah. But giving the people the right jobs. Yep. Yeah, 100%. And I think that's just a conversation that needs to happen. So like one, one easy mm -hmm. answer to that is is to have your whole team sit the Working Genius Assessment. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a series of questions that you can do and then you'll find out personally for you what your geniuses are. And there's a lot of different things that you can do to workshop and to discuss and explore what your geniuses are and then to understand the different types of people on your team and, and what gives them energy as well mm. and the types of things they they like to do because you know in in the in the corporate world sometimes people's roles change based on what their working geniuses are and i know a lot mm -hmm. of I'm, I'm hearing from a lot of other people who are working in different industries you know and you can change people's roles and responsibilities based on those genius outcomes but in the classroom situation if you're mm. a teacher you, you you're you're staying a teacher so there are some things that you mm -hmm. you just naturally have to do but in a in an education setting i think there are still lots of things that you can do to lean on the people next door to you even if you're a single cell teacher you have one class or you're a high school teacher and you have multiple classes that you're working with i think it's 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 just realizing that there are you know teaching is a teamwork uh approach so we have to lean into each other a lot more these days and so mm. i think the days of a teacher seeing themselves as an island and they're not a part of a team of people whether they're in your faculty or you know a lot of modern learning environments where you've got the the advantage of having different teachers that you can lean on you can share those roles out but even even leaning into your students to be able to share some of that workload would be an interesting 
avenue to explore as well. But yeah, big, big idea. Have a think about mm. what types of work at your school you really enjoy and how can I lean into that more so that I'm looking forward to getting to work because there is an element of that, but then I think there's more that we could do to that. And then what are the things that we're doing in the school that I don't really enjoy that really drain me, but I know that further down the track, um, you know, someone in the room next door to me, there might be someone and I'm not going to pass off, like for me, I'm not going to pass off all my assessment data to the person next door, <laughs> but there may be some, <laughs> some shared ownership that we could take or some ways that we could have a chat about how we, how we work on the stuff. Uh, meeting and particularly for leaders it's a really good conversation to start having with your team about how you can share some of that workload around and share some of those roles good conversations on the guest of the show for today we've got miles webb it's good to have you on miles miles is the deputy principal at Ordoa school which is a very i would sort of say small in terms of international size but you're a rural school in, in the taranaki in the north island of new zealand and we're excited to talk to you, Miles, today about the STEAM project that you've been working on, you know, for multiple periods of terms and years. And, and we're excited to dig into that from a school perspective and, and find out some things that we can learn about that. But could you just explain your classroom? Tell us a little bit about some of the other STEAM projects that you might be doing in your school, because I know that uh, when I've visited there before, there have been some amazing stuff happening. Thank you, Mark. And hello, Bex and Kia Kato, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm Miles Webb. I'm the Deputy Principal at um, Otoa Primary School in uh, South Taranaki. I've been here now on staff for eight years. So we're a school of 200 students. We're really, really lucky that though we're very much rural, we're a one-on-one iPad school. And in our senior year seven, eight classes, we've got MacBooks, MacBook Airs. I guess the biggest thing with our school is, is we are really, really lucky with the support we have from the community and also the sort of pedagogical approach here that we've got a lot of projects that are running. And uh, we've got, for instance, our PTA just going to authorise the purchase very shortly of a brand new industrial laser cutter for the school. We've got multiple 3D printers in the school, multiple devices, and sort of our kind of one of our ethos is that we want to get the kids involved in, in WOW projects. And as myself as a teacher, originally I've been teaching for over 20 years now. I originally started teaching in, I guess, inner city schools, which I absolutely loved and sit in. in in Auckland, New Zealand's biggest city, and then Hamilton for a time, both those locations. But for myself and my family, we wanted to look at moving somewhere different, and we ended up somewhere rural. So I went from teach back in an environment where in a city kind of things with um, what I guess would we'd look at inner city kids to. We have a school now with 200 students, but if we walked out onto the front of the school on the road that goes past, there, there are no cars just because it's just a quiet day and um, sort of farming and dairy farming in particular, students and their families is the main driving force. So a lot of things that we do get tied in with that. So we've got a really good community. We are spoiled thanks to the community support for some of the projects that we do. I like that tying in with the sort of STEM side of things where like in the past we've had students who had a year long project to build a full scale pinball machine which we've then used sort of for online on screen competition for the students and things like that which has been really good so I had never worked at a school longer than five or six years and I'm out and then I started teaching I was like five years they're never going to do any more than that and I feel through school yeah and I stuck to that and then the other day I was like I've been here nine years and you kind of go oh but um, like one of the things for me as a teacher, I want to stay motivated with what I'm doing. I want to do something that excites me. Um, if I'm behind a, I think as teachers, there's, there's a challenge for us not to fall mm. into a kind of a pattern or to, or to do the same things over and over again. So I like changing year levels. Um, I like trying to do different things and um, trying to look at getting uh, the students involved in things that mm. are like, I guess really worthwhile, but also really relevant to them. So that's where that longitudinal STEAM mm. project, the longest one I've been involved mm -hmm. in, um, sort of comes in with. This. Yeah, you know, I think maybe just to help people give you know, a bit of context about your school too. I, like, school, that, you think like, I think that community connection, the rural flavour, you know, that that's a real mm. distinct part of the character of it. One of the things, Bex, you've been there as well, is that you walk out yeah. the front gate and you're on the main road and there's the beautiful mountain there. You know, that, that's just mm -hmm. such a, a massive... 
um, icon, yep. I guess, that's sort of sitting in the background mm -hmm. of, of everything that you do. It's so visible there on a good day, whenever it's not covered in cloud. And that, that's a beautiful, distinctive thing. Among it's amazing. And like if I'm doing, um, if we do a mystery Skype call or we're Google Earthing our school to somewhere else, you know, or if we're sometimes sharing photos, yeah. we reference mm -hmm. the fact that we have a, you know, have the long, I have a volcano next to us, which mm -hmm. we're between <laughs> that and us not wearing shoes in class yeah. or people in America. And Miles, I could, you could feel, you could feel, sorry, I'm just going to go back to that because it is an incredible yeah, so special place and you can feel at the moment you walk in. And I think mm. this has been integral to the success of your projects is that you've got this incredible community that back what you do and support mm. what you do and help fund what you do. Um, and this in turn has given these kids an incredible experience. Like I, I can, I, when we came out of the, the visiting, visiting there, Nicole and I were just dumbfounded with the opportunities your kids get we were absolutely yeah. blown away they are so lucky so yeah i think this yeah that that's sort of the foundations in order to get where you are um to get these projects yeah have it yeah it's yeah yeah no absolutely and um you know like mm. so the project um the with the sound lure sort of part of things um, wasn't supposed to be a long wow. project, but we're actually looking now at going in sort of five years in now. Mm -hmm. And essentially some of the students have now moved on through to high school, but the, the sort of the main aspects are sort of still there. And so I'm kind of running it, um, in a much more, I guess, hands-off approach than we did originally. But I think if you look at the sort of progression of it and, um, it's been, uh, experience, um, I don't know because of the length of time, if I necessarily want to do something like that again, but again, it comes back to that ethos of, for me as a teacher, I want to be challenged by what I do. If, and before I started this thing, I, I dabbled a little bit in sort of electronics, but not to a major level. And I guess I've probably upskilled myself a lot and. Yeah. Um, Can we go right back to the beginning? Because what you're describing, you, you started to, it's um, called the Sound Lure Project. That was a STEAM and integrated, when we're talking about STEAM, for those who aren't aware, you know, we're talking about an integrated uh, curriculum approach where you've got like an inquiry kind of a level uh, problem that you need to solve. You're working towards a solution that obviously connects with authentic uh, yep. real world applications. So tell us how it all started for you. Right back in 2017 and 2018, we had done um, a couple of projects to do with our local Awa, our local river. And when we were looking at those, we were looking at um, the field the, with Blue Duck, and which has been, uh, was, has been previously in Taranaki, but has essentially been, apart from very protected, narrow um, tracts of land, uh, locally it's been eliminated, and it's been eliminated predominantly by um, stoats um, or just introduced pest species into New Zealand. And so we did a study of sort of the New Zealand ecosystem. And for those people who don't know, the New Zealand ecosystem is amazing, but through its geographic isolation in the 1800s, um, when we had the first sort of European settlement, um, they brought with them some particular animals. And amongst those were the brush-tailed possum, which and we've, we've talked about this, but so the brush-tailed possum in New Zealand is probably our biggest pest, whereas in Australia it's protected. But the um, at that time they bought in um, some of the mustelid family, which are the stoats, the weasels, and ferrets. And where we live locally, so where we live rurally, in the last um, two months, I've probably seen I've seen personally three or four stoats. Uh, <laughs> Predominantly shooting across the road as I'm as I'm driving to and from work, and I only live 15 minutes from work. But um, they and those, those animals are, are extremely um, aggressive, and we had problems with them. And so, the context for the problem originally was, you know, we were looking at this 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 native bird and whether we'd be able to introduce it, and then we were looking at some way to follow it up. We've got students in the farming environment who are actively involved in trapping and trapping of what we've identified as pests in our areas. And again, that's pro predominantly, but not exclusively those ones. So we have a large number of possums as, as, as we rural, although even some of the sort of towns in our area still have them. And again, when you're know, looking at things like stoves, weasels and ferrets. So I've got students in my class and had students in my class at the time 
that were trapping. Um, the council was very keen to get students involved in, in doing extra things. And we were looking at um, something something extra. And then at the same time, I was trying to think of a way that I could tie in that STEM approach because I had these kids who were trapping at home. We had uh, units of study to do with the council and units of study to do with um, like resourcing. Doc's got some great resourcing. And I wanted some way to sort of tie it all together. And it, um, I had a really, like a, a really lucky moment where a person who worked for Doc, an amazing guy came in and he gave me this little electronic box and he said, oh, he said, maybe your kids could make something like this. And it was just a little, um, what I describe as a sound box. So it was a tiny little box um, that I could hold in the palm of my hand. Uh, it was set up with disposable batteries. Uh, it had a little light sensor on it. It had been like hot glue gun together. And it just basically, they'd put it out with some possum um, traps and made noise and some possums had shown interest in it. And he sort of was talking about that. That sort of was one of those moments where I knew because we had kids at school who had, uh, we had the, we'd, we'd done, I'd, I, I was aware of some things like micro bit kits um, we've done some basic Arduino work with the STEM. And then yeah. I wanted to see how, and the little bits kits as well, which are the same kinds of things. So the small like <laughs> electronic things that the kids can put together and make beeps and noises. And so I wanted to think of a way to get the students operating with some electronics, but instead of making something in the classroom that made some noise to see if we could replicate this box and, and essentially put it out with a sort of conventional trapping thing, because conventional traps, for those people who don't know, for um, stoats at the moment, and docs still do this, they use rabbit meat mm. as, a, as, a, as a lure. There, there, there are some variations and things going on, but that's essentially how, how they do it. So it was that, and um, for possums, the main thing is you're using fruit and food and things mm. like that. So that was sort of the kind of the, the genesis of it. And then as a teacher, because I knew nothing about electronics, um, I decided to, I sat down with my class who at the time was sort of, oh, well, we year five and year six. And then um, they, they were great because I kind of looked at it and thought, oh, I think I could do that, but we'll see. And then one of the kids in the very first meeting we had, because they were disposable batteries mm -hmm. and every three days they had to find this unit, which was out oh, in the bush. Yeah take the batteries, throw the batteries away, put new batteries and change it over. And one of the kids just looked mm, at me about wow. 10 months in and said, well, why don't we do a little solar panel with it? And I said, well, you can't get solar panels. And then one of the kids was like, well, at Bunnings or the warehouse, I can't remember, but there were mm -hmm. those little, oh, they still have, they've got those solar yeah. animals that are <laughs> like stick five. in the garden. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no, 21. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it was like, could you somehow get that done and then use that to make the sound and then try and see what effect that would have. And um, I then started looking at some sourcing of, of funding. Now, our, our school's really well funded, but I thought if I want to do this justice, I need to get involved with a sort of people yeah. whose skill set I might be able to adapt, but bring in on the project. Um, because originally I was going to, oh, I'll just order some parts on AliExpress and I'll, I'll just put some stuff together and I'll make it and it'll be great. Um, I, after about a, gosh, a couple of months, I'd resorted to ordering a recording box that was from a stuffed, um, <laughs> like it was a stuffed beer mm -hmm, or something mm -hmm. and you could record a message and put it inside the beer yeah. and then like it would play back on like a loop. Um, and that, that so I, I tried like a real basic level and wasn't really getting anywhere and the kids were sort of having fun with it and we'd modified a couple of doorbells and stuff and changed some things around but it wasn't really happening and then um I, i'd been involved in a science project before um we have in taranaki the curious minds project which is funded by venture taranaki which is amazing and we were able to put a proposal together that got accepted mm. that bankrolled it um, which was really good for my school because my school is supportive and been amazing and fantastic. But I was able to come to it and say, they're going to mm -hmm. give us X number of dollars. And, and it was a lot of money for the project. And we had to manage all the costs. 
but that allowed me to then tap a couple of um, local experts. And from there, we developed a prototype, which is solar powered, which essentially does you know, the job that we wanted it to do that's programmable. Uh, the kids were able to put it together, so it did require some, mm-hmm. it still does require some basic soldering, but we had the kids essentially making it. Um, and plus at the same time, the, the trapping part of it, you know, the units were sort of there and we were developing ideas and stuff, but we also had the kids that were getting involved with the trapping and, and still in the trapping now. I've got kids now who, they're, you know, they're, mm-hmm. they're, I don't like the term farm kids or I don't like people saying city folk or whatever, but we have children living locally mm-hmm. who are trapping actively at the moment because that's good for the environment. And my big sort of thing, my big kind of takeaway for the project for me is <laughs> I've probably mm-hmm. spent a few too many hours on it and a little bit of my time. Um, but my big mantra for me has always been we want to upskill the kids because it's the kids in the future that are going to be the yeah. people mm-hmm. with the mindset and the skill set moving forward to do things. And if I'm getting these kids aware of things like possums and the damage they do or, or stoats and particularly and the damage they do, they'll carry that forward so that when they become adults mm. and, and, you know, mm. they've got that skill set, mm. that mindset. So that was sort of how that all started. Um, and as I said, we got experts involved. You know, uh, I I could use a voltmeter a little bit, um, but I found a, a local electronics expert who's been amazing, and I'm still working with him now mm. five years later. It's kind of a friendship that's grown out of the project, but his expertise filled a massive gap I had. Um, the kids got involved in it. Um, we got a little, a lot yeah, t- of. Tell us um, about that, Miles, because like I, it, that was one of really, the things really that good. I think um, we started having this conversation them. when I was in your office, and I saw your trophy on the wall. <laughs> you know, you, tell us about that. So we had we got nominated for like a a regional environmental award, and so mm. the children were able to go to the actual council awards, and we were one of sort mm. of four innovators nominated, mm. which was great, and they got to speak in front of a few hundred people. Um, we entered the one, two, three tech awards, uh, the Tahiru Toru mm. um, tech awards, which we won in 2020 with, with this project, which was, you know, a, no. again, for me as a teacher, you know, I want these, like, it's not just about awards mm. and I don't like getting mm. awards and stuff for myself, but for the kids to be involved in like a nationally recognized project or a national competition as a result of work that they're just doing anyway, that was really, really awesome. And so they, they won that, which was great. Um, and it put us in connection, you know, like, um, it, it was, it was these funny, it has been some of these funny things. We were doing a thing about stoats at the start and one of the kids said to me, oh, I've found this person who, who's at uh, Waikato University, who's like a stoat expert. I will just send them an email. And the lady actually had been responsible for writing, uh, an actual hard book text on stoats, but she was happy to hear back from the kids get involved with the kids, give us feedback on what we were doing. Um, the the kids generally have just been, I, I guess, barriers that I'd probably put in mm. place because like the solar power, power, power thing is an example right at the start. It's probably not something mm. I would have thought of. The students yeah. looked at it with their eyes when they said, well, but, haven't you tried this? Haven't you tried that? And, and it was things like that that we got working. So it's technically still an up got, got ongoing project at the moment but the good thing is the last couple of years I've been able to step away from it a little bit and I've got a group of kids who are going to work on it we kind of we spend a lot of time looking at getting the unit made originally and having the unit working originally and it's it, we've got one prototype that's now been working so effectively um, rota- rotating its its cycle now for four years and it's still working. Um, we've got another batch of units we're just running a test with at the moment um, and we've got to go out with a field trip and just check how that's working and we're getting ready next term to have a look at our students deploying the, you know, these things in conjunction. It's, it's, it's incredible, Miles, and, and I think one of the things on, that on makes this project stand out so, is just the length yeah. of time that you've been working on it. Um, you know, I work with a lot of schools that are, are trying to develop what we call one day or one month or sometimes it's very sort of timely to fit a steam project into a term you know it's like the 10 week term magical wrap it up at the end of the term and then we go on holiday and we're on to the next thing what mm. is, what is it about what what have you been able to do to or how has your approach managed to go over year after year 
because you said it's been five years. So, so the the intention with with that originally, and particularly right. with that first level of funding, was to do one year and then be finished. Mm-hmm. And COVID threw out the timetable completely because we'd had trips, you know, scheduled and things were going to happen, and they closed. Uh, well, school was closed, and we had all these barriers put in place. Um, I guess the other thing too is that the we looked at when we started the project and we got that funding, the, the things that we got were, weren't disposable. So because we purchased mm. the kind of hardware, we still got the hardware from, you know, from there now and it's still working. Um, the other thing, I guess, for me, I can see that there's still very enthusiastic students mm-hmm. at the school yeah. for it because it's something authentic to them and something a lot of them are doing anyway. The, I've got I've got one of them at the moment who who I need to get some gear to, and he's in a really positive way, is 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 kind of badgering me about it. But what he's doing, he's just coming back to me and saying, right, you know, I need this, this, and this. Can you get this for me? And I've got the connections to get it for him. But I, you know, because it's been the start of the term and it's been a bit crazy, and so he's going to keep going. Um, I've got several families where it's like older siblings have done trapping, mm. and it's sort of passed through to the next kind of group of kids so that's been really good um i guess underpinning it i wanted to see it through to its conclusion um and i'm not quite sure where that's going to go um because the 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 child part of it has been great i've I've really enjoyed the child part of it that explain that a bit more what do you mean by the child probably been more Mm. challenging in some ways yeah, so the, the kids' enthusiasm has been really great. Their ideas have been fantastic. They haven't looked at certain barriers or certain challenges. And they yeah, just, no, no, we don't even. And then when mm. I say, again, I, I think I'm interchanging the word kids, I should say students, but students involved have been uh, from year five to year eight, but this year I've got a three, four class. You know, if there's been a problem, they, they tend to look at it and say, well, why can't you do this? Whereas mm-hmm. as an adult, you probably are a bit more guarded mm-hmm. about things because you maybe think it would be so successful. That's been really interesting. And the other thing too is that sometimes, because I've got, I'm using the students at my school or my students at the school are, are using some of the technology or some of the equipment. We're not having to prearrange things with anything else. You know, we've got that, uh, like I've, I've done the paperwork or I've got the preparation there. So they'll go and do it. Uh, with some of the organisations I've been involved in, we, we've had to have pre-meetings for people coming here. We've had to have sort of some things that that, that we can be discussed mm-hmm. and we've had other other influences in it. So it's, it's been, the kids have been amazing. The mm-hmm. adults have been pretty good. We've met some just incredible people through so many different organizations and that has just been phenomenal. Um, and then, you know, we've just had some other, other bits and pieces happen and it's been like, for me as a teacher, I've done bits and pieces for a few years with some things. But it's absolutely been the the, you know, the longest project that I've been involved in. And I guess mm. you want to make something definitive at the end and have an end point for it. But I also, if I've got enthusiasm mm. there for it, um, it, it becomes yeah. a self-fulfilling thing, I guess, or the, the, the enthusiasm of the students. You know, like, I think that's a really key thing. You want to get something that's authentic. Mm. You want to get something that's... So, really Mars, uh, that, I was just going to touch on that, actually, because um, all I can hear right now is this student agency it's authentic Mm. relevant learning for your kids um it's something though that i talk to schools all over the place and they keep saying oh we want to do steam we want to do steam and we and that's awesome but then we seem to get quite a few barriers and quite a few like oh no we we can't do this or no this is or it's not you know it's not going to work how do you think what what would you recommend to teachers or how could you endorse steam why would you want to have that in your schools? Like, what, what is it? What is the magic mm. that it has produced for your kids? I, I appreciate that every school's different with their, their, their setup and, and sometimes their, their values and sometimes their program. Um, I, and, and I mean, I've been very lucky in, in, in my experience. I've been a couple of times to overseas schools and seen some different educational systems completely. And I also know in New Zealand, depending on the school you know the values of the school and sometimes the the i guess the progression of the students can can be a really big thing like i said if i go back to the start for me i want to be motivated by things that 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 interest me as someone who's been a teacher uh, over a long period of time 
I want to get um, my students motivated. Mm -hmm. I think if I'm motivated, my students will get motivated. I like the openness of the STEAM. Um, you know, and one of the examples I like to use with people is 3D printing, and I've done a bit of 3D printing over the years, but one of the things that I'm really, um, even this year, like, despite my advancing years, you know, I've got a year three, four classroom of students. I, I think generally the mindset would not necessarily be that 3D printing, maybe it's a little bit too much for them, but actually mm -hmm. I've seen some just fantastic stuff already from my new class, and some of those kids are eight years old, and it's, it's that took that like I, I like to, them to have a little bit of a tutu. I like like them to be able to play with stuff and do stuff. Mm, and mm. That creativity, those ideas that kids get, hmm. it's magic in a bottle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's obviously more, it's not magic in a bottle, but you know what I mean. You mm -hmm. have those moments, and for me as a teacher, that's why I want to keep teaching because I want the students to enjoy themselves. And as I say, I think you know, steam. You've got obviously children who, who excel in everything. You've got some who excel yeah. in some ways, but that creativity, being able to harness that in that way is really good. It doesn't work everywhere. I've, I've worked in schools mm. in the past where the approach that, that I'm using now wouldn't work. Uh, I'm very lucky that I've got a management yeah. um, and it's, it's that pedagogy I go back to at the start is one of the reasons I'm still here. That if I come up with a a crazy idea, but no, I wouldn't come up with a crazy idea, but something that could be challenging yeah. or something that could be, you know, like a, like a project. Mm. And, and that is so, and that is, I think, that, one of the critical that, that factors that here. make, um, you know, so a, I, an environment at your school where this type of learning can thrive. And I think it's testament to the leadership, you know, like we've, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've known Jared for a while and, you know, as yep. a principal, one of the things that you, and you do in your leadership are, are with, with the team as well. Like we often, what I used to end my STEAM workshops when I was introducing schools to it was around this whole idea of, um, you know, not so much seeing your classroom or your school as a factory, which is what we used to have in the pre-industrialized and industrialized era where we were kind of pumping students through a factory line. And sadly, I think a lot of our classrooms are like that. It's like, I've got this curriculum, I'm gonna get them through and we're gonna assess them at the end. But trying to encourage people to see their classroom like a garden. And so you've got to kind of look at all of the, the cultural aspects, the structure, the things that you put in place um, to be able to help students thrive in that kind of environment. And STEAM is the perfect way for that to happen. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's so good. But one, of the, one of the things that I've picked up just mm -hmm. while you've been talking, mm -hmm. Miles, is that in that STEAM approach, you know, how I'm, we're often talking about how it starts with a problem and you have to find a solution and you've got a big arch, overarching problem, which was, you know, for you, it was um, trying to find yep. a, a way to help those native ducks thrive back in an environment where they weren't in anymore. But then what happens is you're trying to unpack that problem. Then you start yep. to, starting to find all these other little problems along the way as well. It's sort of like a problem chain, which I, it's only just occurred to me. That's exactly what happens along that process. And because yep. you were able to keep going back to it and because you were able to guide the students through that problem sol solution finding process, you, you just kind of kept the momentum going, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, we did. And it, and it was interesting, Mark, because it was things like the whole solar power thing, which we talked about, which came from like the literally the first conversation. It kind of took us about like with the, mm. I had to eventually get the experts involved to make sure that was going to be robust enough to work. And so that ended up taking, I don't know, a couple of years to get that perfected. But like, even in terms of um, knowing what to order and, and, and how the unit needs to work and stuff, and, and with the, the benefit of hindsight, like um, we obviously you know made some decisions to do with like bits and pieces and, it has worked out, but there was there were things like that. Um, that we get a lot of rainfall in winter here, so the moisture with units on the monga was a problem, and how we were going to keep that, how how that keep that working. The the other thing too with it, and some of the biggest stuff. So we've got hours of footage of um, possums and um, other pests interacting with these with these um, traps, or you know, with the lures specifically. One of the things that we're trying to do this year is to get some of the children interacting with some kind of audio experts so we can test the the, the sounds that we're doing, but actually like scientifically get, get them used because some of the stuff we've been doing, the kids, one of the things that we needed possum sounds right back at the start, one of my kids goes, oh yeah, I can do that. And she came, she came back later with about, I don't know, 10, 15 possum calls and all these sounds and I'd ordered them from Doc. And I said, where'd you get them from? 
And so she'd just been on YouTube. She had found people wow. like, filming costumes and stuff, <laughs> stripped off the audio, turned it into an yeah. MP3 file. And you're like, and how, do I, how do I do that? Like, you wouldn't and even know where like to that. start. The majority <laughs> of teachers wouldn't that, have a clue. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, it's, oh, no. That, well, that, that's, you know, like, I've, um, <laughs> I, my, my long, long-suffering wife um, a few years ago asked me for a 3D printing project specifically to do with 3D printing, and um, I, I had to admit to her at that point, despite, despite having kids mm. at that point doing it for about five or six years in the classroom, I'd never actually properly done it myself. <laughs> I love the way that you done something for who else could do it. I, I had it. to get one of the kids to do it. But skill yeah. mm. sets, really, like, to me, that's really important like that because, you, like, as I said, you, you get these kids that, that, that or students that come up with this, these skills mm. and these ideas. And, and, That's so and good. But, you know, one final question, and this really is, I think, probably where the rubber hits the road. I'm, I'm keen mm. to hear what you think about this. I know that for a lot of teachers and a lot of leaders in schools, what what this conversation has done is probably broken the glass ceiling of what they thought was possible because I think for a lot mm. of people, and, and I I was like this when I was a classroom teacher, you're thinking in a, in a term, you might be thinking a year. You definitely aren't thinking a five-year project. Um, but we've just mm. heard the value, right, and, and um, the impact that it's had for your students. If you're a teacher who wants to start a project and they might be thinking five years, you know, or at least beyond the year, where, where do you start? How do you find something that's going to be authentic and will have enough legs over a period of time that will, you know, not only and, and capture something that's going to be motivating for you, but is a, more importantly is going to motivate the students? Where, where would you start? For me, with the sort of, I guess, how kind of the model I've followed, some, mm. I mean, a, a, a local issue or a local community-based mm. real learning experience, uh, those, those terms that, you know, I, I think it needs to be something that the students are able to maybe mm. test or look or contribute to, not necessarily in the classroom environment. Um, the classroom environment's really powerful, but anything that we can do that's going to affect locally and affect maybe where they're living, um, or have an impact on that has got the potential to be really powerful. So I, I, I think local, it's, to me, that's a little bit of a yeah. no-brainer that you want to think where you are locally and what's affecting your students and, or, you know, what stu- and, and as I said before, that student voice about ideas about stuff, your, the students have the most amazing projects and the most mm. amazing ideas. And I just, you know, you tap into that and, and find out from what what they want to look at or what they yeah that is so good that's that awesome Very careful. well miles we'll, we'll put a link to your twitter account uh, in the show notes because i know that there's lots of things that you've been sharing and that was how you and i connected years ago i remember you sharing some things and, and we knew each other on twitter for about four or five years before we ever met in person so we'll, we'll do that Cute. and if you want to check what miles is doing out or he's, yeah, I, know, I know recently you've been posting some of the um, pretty amazing uh, 3D printed material that your kids have been working on. So that's really cool. For people who are interested, so the other yeah. thing too that was really important with the um, sound lure parts of things, so I documented everything. Um, I, I'm still, unfortunately, Great. I am a creature of habit, so it's just on a blog, but I'll, I'll supply the link to that. So there's various bits of information. And if there are people, like one of the things right throughout the project, where I'm still wanting to connect with people who want to do trials and and set things up so if you have a environment where you've got you know that mm. sort of test issue with something cool. for your students if someone wants to get a hold of me i'm more than happy to help out we're able to do the units for 30 40 dollars and the technology part of it. i'm sure you, your class done, would be quite happy to stuff. So you know jump on a google meet or a fantastic. teams call or a zoom call and, and have a have a chat with that we could yep we've, well we've, had, we've got kids yep we've absolutely got kids with that expertise that would be available to do that same thing with like everything else Sharing as teachers mm-hmm. is really important, just letting people know what amazing stuff's happening. And then, you know, no one wants to mm-hmm. be a gatekeeper. We want to help. So good. Miles, it's just well. awesome. So and it's, it's an amazing story to hear, isn't it, Bex? You know, and I think uh, the more oh, that we yeah. can uh, so share inspiring. this around and, and inspire some people. Oh, yeah. So good. <laughs> so yeah. good. Thanks, Hicks, for being on, Miles. <laughs> Thanks, Appreciate Miles. it. 
Well, hey everyone, I just wanted to jump in here with a quick message about an upcoming online program that we think you might be interested in. So if you're listening to this message, uh, this conversation with Miles, and you have a teacher or you are a teacher and you're inspired to learn more about STEAM learning and the impact that it could have for your school and your classroom, or you're already teaching with this approach, maybe you'd love to go deeper or across the school with this powerful teaching method, we have got a great program that we want to tell you about. Our Certified STEAM Leader program is starting its next cohort of teachers this May, and it covers topics such as what a STEAM framework looks like, how do you assess it, how do you overcome common barriers with your own classroom and with your team, and so much more. It's delivered over six months with a series of online modules that we send to you. You unpack them on six group calls, roughly one a month, month and then we work on that with a STEAM project alongside a coaching program that works to help you develop your classroom and your school STEAM learning program. If you want to find out more go to our website at utb.fyi forward slash STEAM leader and register and all the information is there so that's utb.fyi forward slash STEAM leader. Okay, we've got Rachel, one of our trainers in the North Island here, to, to join us about Canva. And I know that one of the things about leadership and teaching in the classroom is there are so many features that are coming out with some of the tools that we're using, even if you're really familiar with Canva and you've used it uh, in your classroom or in your school. Rachel, this is your chance to tell us some about the new features that are coming up. Yeah, cool. So one of the first new features that I absolutely love, it's been around um, for a little while, but it's slowly getting, well, they're making it better just because of all the AI that's kind of coming out and coming to the forefront. And that is the text to image tool. Now, the thing that I love about this is that it can be used in so many different areas, but it makes your life easier for like those days where you just need like a writing prompt. Uh, that's what I personally would use it for and have used it uh, in previous well, last year when it first came out, it's one of those great things. So it is one of the apps on Canva, which can be found if you've got a premium account. So teachers, if you need to get one of those premium accounts, it's actually free. You can get teacher premium accounts for free, which is we great. Love free. Everybody, especially teachers, loves free things. And it's one of the mm. apps that actually uh, you've got to click into the apps on the side of your canvas. So you've got all the templates, you've got all the elements, your projects and things like that. And then right down the bottom is apps. Now in that you will find text to image uh, tool, which is right there and is like one of the top ones that you can find. If you can't just search through Canva apps and write text to image, and it does pop up. So the thing that I love about this is that it does give you a few sentences of inspiration for you to start off with, but you can input anything that you want and it will generate an image, whether it be a concept art, a photo, <laughs> a painting, drawing a 3D image, or even like a pattern, and it will go straight into your documents. It'll also upload it so you can uh, grab it from your images later on as well. So it saves it for you all in your Canva account. I was having a bit of a play with this again before because it has changed and it's got now all the different art forms that you can do. So your photo, your 3D, your patterns and things. Fun one to do if you want to have a bit of a trial with it is just use one of these sentences. Third one on the list is a panda riding a bike through a city with depth of field. And you can hear the description there. So you can add as many words as you want add as much description as you want, and then it'll generate some kind of image, whether it be a square, landscape, or portrait, and you can just pop it into whatever document you've got there. So, I mean, you can use this not just for literacy, there's so many other ways that you can use it and get students to start creating pictures uh, for anything that they're doing, presentations, but it is a really fun little app to just have a bit of a play with and, and use within your school. Give me uh, something that you want to see. What should we do? Go, it's go, Bex. A snake climbing up a tree on Mars. And we'll push create. So you can put locations in there. You can put objects in there. It does take a few minutes to transform it. Um, and don't forget to put what's on Stars. There we go. There's your images. Oh, right my there. goodness. So, so this will so take the whole, like, I think back to when I was in the classroom and I had to draw that on the whiteboard and all the kids would be like, what are you doing? That looks like a peacock and it's supposed to be a person. You know, so this takes all that out of it, right? This is so cool. 
Definitely. And I mean, you think of this as well, as it's a piece of artwork. You get students recreating that artwork as well and using it to do different styles of art because you don't only just have the 3D, you've got the sketching tools as well. So that's what yeah. I love about it. You could draw from that in so many different ways. It's not searching in Google, is it, for, for those who aren't quite aware of what's happening. This is artificially uh, intelligent yeah, <laughs> working in behind the scenes to actually recreate images that haven't mm. been made. Could you say now create it in the style of Picasso, for so example? And it, would it doesn't respond it? like ChatGPT or the Microsoft okay, yep. thing does. Um, you just have to kind of start again and and put in some uh, more words. But hey, that could be something that Canva is working on because it has said when you click onto this that there's more works happening Ooh. and then you get feedback. So there you go, Mark. Yeah. Why don't we send Canva that feedback and ask them to make it a conversation rather than just a start over again? This is Canva on steroids, in my opinion. Like when, when Canva came out, it was so exciting because I was one of those people that would love to create awesome slides for the kids or like for my staff meetings or I even I even developed our strategic plan and, and did that all on Canva as sort of a um, design tool. But mm. this has come so far and I can just see how it can make teachers' lives so much easier and so much better because there's so many templates on there already. I mean, there's slideshow templates, there's doc templates, there's lessons that are already ready to go on there. So it's one of those tools that really you really need to dive into and have a play around and just see the, the opportunities are endless to use it in the classroom and in, in, in schools and even yeah, senior leadership as well. Definitely. And I think the great thing about Canva is now that you can actually be sharing these assignments to Google Classroom. So if you've got mm. Google Classroom integrated, there's that option as well. You don't just have the templates mm. and things like that. It's now sharing. You can bring in on the apps is actually the option to bring in photos from your Google Drive. So they've got the Google Drive app there. Um, so bring in your photos, anything that you've been doing, that maybe you've saved your photos to your Google Drive, you can bring them in to whatever you're working on. Uh, it could be a jambled background and you want to have a picture there and they're brainstorming different things. Just use the app, put the picture in from Google Drive and boom, it just makes your life so much easier. And Canva is just, there's so many creative forms there that you can use. Uh, it just makes things, yeah, just so much more, I guess, I'm not going to say fun. Alive. Alive yeah. students to you. Yeah. You've got the emojis so, in the apps. You've got, I know teachers love to use their Bitmojis too, so you can uh, connect your Bitmoji and put your Bitmoji onto whatever you're creating with your students. There is so many endless options. Oh, there's also Google Maps. So add in, if you're wanting to look at maps, geography and things like that, snapshot from Google Maps. And that's one of the apps as well that you can use too. So, yeah, so many options. That's great. L lots to explore. And I think get, jumping in there and having a look around and seeing mm -hmm. all the features that keep getting added, almost like weekly. You know, I heard a, uh, somebody saying on one an Instagram reel about how you can add text. You bullet point it out and then hit the text to slides button. I haven't found this feature in there yet. Um, you just have to do a little play, but it will turn that text into a slide deck for you um, yeah, based definitely. on a whole lot of templates. So mm. if, a, if a teacher doesn't have access to the free premium account or the premium account that they can get for free, how do they go about doing that? So you jump onto, there's a page, Canva for Education, and they can apply for it. Now, lots of teachers okay. in New Zealand, I don't know if this is also across the world, have been struggling a lot with getting their account verified to be a teacher. Um, so what we've figured out is, look, you can just kind of screenshot either a little bit of your payslip uh, as long along with your registration, flick it to them in an email with the email address that you're using for the Canva free account, and then they should come back to you and um, give it to you for free. But it is available to be free for all teachers. And within that, mm. you can create your own Canva classrooms for your students, get them into the team, get them creating things as well. So yeah, don't worry if it declines you, they will accept it. You just have to go around and email them and it will be on that Canva for Education uh, website um, tab as well. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Can I just Brilliant. add a little plug in the end here is that Rach is one of our incredible trainers in New Zealand and you can get her free into the schools if you come through um, Ministry of Education um, PLD funding. So if you want help with this kind of stuff, this is what we do. It's our bread yeah. and butter. So come along. Uh, yeah, hit me up um, and I'm happy to help. But that's we work in New Zealand. We work in Australia, working all over um, Southeast Asia now, too. So we're here to help. And yeah, hit us up if you want some more support with this kind yeah. of stuff, because that's what we love to do. Exactly. And I'm Brilliant. more than happy to do some online sessions with people as well. If that's what they're wanting, we don't just do it in person. We do online sessions and 
uh, this is, yeah, what a great tool to be able to utilize within your classroom or even within businesses too. Oh, cool. Super cool. We'll have a couple of links there for people to get in contact with Rachel or get in contact with our team, uh, and we'll have a link to be able to get the free account. Thanks for joining cool. us, Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. Awesome. No worries. All right, episode eight in the can. Bex, final thoughts from you. All right, so we have dived into two really exciting ways to enhance classrooms and schools today. Canva with Rach, and I urge you to go and have a play around, and I don't blame me when you suddenly lose hours of your day going down those rabbit holes. Uh, and then hearing Miles talk about STEAM in schools. If you want an authentic and engaging learning, this is the way to go. And he's a wealth of knowledge, so feel free to use the links in the show notes to hit him up. Lastly, I just want to touch base on Mark's Making Wave segment. Please do take stock of your energy. If you're feeling like things are feeling heavy or hard already, um, identify something or someone in your life that can refill your cup. I'd also make this a weekly reflection, a temperature gauge at the end of the week for you to be still and notice how you're mm. feeling and act on that. We're in early in, we're early on in the year, so putting practices like this into place will really help you see out the year positively. Uh, definitely. It's uh, it's one of those things that's to work on for all of us, I think, and the mm. more that we go through this year, the more that we can you know keep working on ways that are going to fill our tanks. Absolutely. If you're after some links or some resources from some of the things that we talked about today, whether you want to contact Miles on his Twitter account or you want to uh, have a look at his blog particularly, there'll be links in the show notes. You can go and check those out. We post every week and we'd also love to have you subscribe to our channel if you want to find out some of the latest updates and things that are coming out. Uh, we'd love to have you joining us every week. We post every Wednesday. If you know someone who'll get value from these episodes, we, we often encourage you to hit that share button and tag them on a social post. Let them know, uh, especially if there's a topic that we've covered that you think they'd get a special value from. And lastly, if you've got questions or anything to share with us, email us as always at team at usingtechnologybetter.com. We'd love to chat with you. Uh, we'll hopefully see you somewhere soon and see you next week. Kakite. See ya.